got a good talk coming ahead now of somebody who is another excellent person to have a conversation with. Deborah is one of the colleagues that I work very closely with and has a directorship and leadership of the educational provision across the entirety of the college. And she's going to give us a talk about endless learning. So welcome. Thank you very much, Deborah. Jenny, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Fantastic. Um, so this is all being filmed with Panopto, so I'm a bit of a wanderer normally, so I'm confined here. It's not that I don't want to wander over there, it's that I, the camera only captures me here. So um, can I add to Jenny's welcome and welcome you to Imperial College um, it's an absolute delight to meet you. I've, I've met only a few of you, and I'd love to meet you all. Uh, be very clear. Be very clear. The reason why you're here at Imperial College, apart from your own motivation, is because you're some of the best students in the world. We only select great people. It's hugely competitive in, this, in the fantastic faculty of medicine, and you have got a great group of people who will support you through your studies. So you should be proud that you're even here. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Now the hard work really starts. So, uh, um, and we've got people from all over the world. We're a global institution. We have staff from all over the world. We have students from all over the world. And that's one of the joys of Imperial College. We're one of the most global institutions in the UK. Um, and we are constantly working to improve and enhance your experience. We might work you hard, but we try as much as we can to make your experience life-changing. You might have seen recently, you know, not that any vice chancellor really takes any notice of any league table, um, but it was really nice that we split Oxford and Cambridge. Fantastic. I think that's really good. That's the first time. Beginning of a trend, I think. So, um, I'm... I was asked, Jane asked me to do, to, to give a talk, and uh, it was sort of very, fairly sort of open-ended about what I could talk about, which is unusual, because I'm usually talking about the National Student Survey, or the education strategy, or government policy about higher education, so this is, I've got slight free reign here. Um, I also then had a big caution, a note given to me about, don't use any images that you don't have copyright for, and all those sorts of things. So in the making of this presentation, no copyright has been breached. No exciting pictures will occur. And, and, you might, and it's all just text. So, sorry about that. But let me take you, what I want to do is give you a reflection. So share some reflections of my journey um, as a postgraduate post student um, and, and to, this, to the point that I'm at now. And some lessons and things I've learned and the other thing, of course, about middle-aged women like me giving you advice, reflecting on their journey, is you have the complete liberty to utterly ignore all of it. Um, but let's, let's see where we go with this. So I'm going to talk about um, four key stages, really. So professional training, where did, where, was, where did I come from? How did I get to here? I want to talk about the masters, what a, what a masters did for me. Um, the PH, my PhD, which um, still burns with me every day, in a good way. Um, and then the absolute joy that I have now of being the supervisor of PhD students. And it is an absolute privilege. Um, and I have, have, have had and have got some astonishing students. And I, you know, it's my job to make sure they shine. So I'm going to take those, those four areas. That's two of my slides gone already. So, I was talking to a colleague earlier. I'm saying, let me go back and ask those, that really straightforward question. Do any of you know what you want to be one of when you grow up? Has anybody got a plan that looks like a straight line to a certain point? No? So that's what... Um, I still ask myself every day, what do I really want to be one of when I grow up? When, when will? And remember, you'll all, you'll all be working till you're about 80 or 90, won't you? 
If, in your, if you're in the UK, you will, because there won't be any pensions. <laughs> so you're going to have to work a long time. So how do we ever really discover what we want to be one of? How do we ever know? In a world where the opportunities to do other amazing things continually come along. Some of the scientific disciplines that you're going to be studying 20 years ago didn't exist. Some of you will, through your studies, move those disciplines on themselves. You will create new views of the world. We'll turn bacteria into gene therapy carriers and vectors, as I've been learning about earlier. You'll be doing some of that pioneering work. You'll be changing the nature of disciplines. So how can we ever really, you know, the things will continually evolve. Um, I, started, uh, I started with a plan. So I originally trained as, I, well, originally I wanted to teach PE and geography. <laughs> if I ever get the chance, I'm going back to do an undergraduate geography degree. There, I've, I've said it, I'm out now, you know it. I'm a secret geographer. Um, but I went and tra I trained as a nurse and came up through the NHS in the days when the National Health Service in the UK trained nurses and before we were ever in universities. Um, and their investment was amazing. So I, I am a massive supporter of the National Health Service. Troubled and traumatic though it may be, it's an amazing institution in the UK. And I got the opportunity through various doors being opened. And, and what's happened, it seems to me, all the way through my career path, and I suspect it's already happening to yourselves, is when opportunity, opportunities will come along. And if you're willing to grasp them, take them. Because they don't come, when they come, they usually come for somebody who's prepared and ready for them. So I've got to the point to this job, basically, through just a whole series of opportunities. You have to work hard, but opportunities come along. And you create those opportunities by your motivation, by your interest, by sometimes just doing that bit more than just everybody else does. I know that sounds competitive, but if you're really involved and interested in your area of discipline and in your studies, you know, go a bit further, think a bit wider, challenge some of the assumptions. So I could never have imagined back in, I won't tell you when, um, I just told you I'm a middle-aged woman, that will do. Um, I, can't, I can't ever, I could never have imagined when I started out training as a nurse that I'd end up as the Vice Provost Education at Imperial College, you know, one of the world's top 10 universities. Wow. So opportunity happens. Um, the quest for talent as well is everywhere. The world exists and spins and does well because of the talent. And I look at you and I look at the talent of the future. That one of the biggest pleasures that Jane and Jenny and I get, and all the faculty of medicine get, is watching talented people come in, engage in the education and learning at college and the research, and just go on and do brilliant things. I love watching people just go, Phew. it's the most... It's the most privileged thing there is to light the blue touch paper of inquiry and watch somebody just go. And that's what we want to do. That's what the faculty will do for you. So I started in the NHS, worked my way through, have had very much a non-traditional career. So started in the NHS, went then the NHS sponsored me to go and learn to be a teacher. Learning to teach others properly understanding pedagogical theory, understanding all of the elements about how people learn as opposed to how you teach, I think it's a really valuable lesson. If you get the opportunity while you're here and want to engage in some teaching, I'm sure Jane will be able to, to help you because you will be teaching others. You have a responsibility to pass your knowledge on to others. So my, tr my pathway was completely non-traditional. I trained as a nurse, then went on to do my teacher training to go back and teach nurses. Um, and the NHS funded all of that and paid me a salary to do it. That's a massively unusual situation these days because of the funding situation. Um, my career is not a straight line. And many of you will have careers that are not straight lines. Uh, it's been the opportunity to work for various pieces of government, to work at the Department of Health, 
uh, to work for regional health authorities, to go back to the NHS, to come into higher education. So there are lots of spheres in which you'll be able to use your talent. And the world is constantly seeking talent. Uh, and we hope, I hope that what we do is make you the talent of the future. My one very sophisticated illustration. I was quite proud about the boxes. So I'm, there I am, working away as a nurse tutor, uh, teaching the nurses of the future coming through, um, challenging some of the assumptions. I got my first job in a school of nursing, which was incredibly traditional. Um, and during my teacher training, I'd been involved in some research, which is about, should we, should we teach healthcare professionals how to communicate effectively? It's a bit of a no-brainer now. You know, all those years ago, we were thinking, oh, maybe, maybe people don't communicate particularly effectively. Maybe we can help them. So I was involved in this research study, which I did when I was at, um, at college. And then my first job, one of the things that the researchers wanted to do was to follow up to see whether I was translating that research knowledge, that input, into, into my practice as an educator. So I worked in this particularly traditional school of nursing. I was probably one of the youngest there. Um, I was probably the only one without gray hair. Um, and I had, was given the responsibility for a group of nurses who were coming in, and they had a six-week training block at the beginning. And this training block had always been exactly the same. And urine testing was always on the second Wednesday, the second Wednesday of the six weeks. It had been for years. It continued to be so. So um, I needed to clear a day so we could do some um, input, some teaching on communication skills. And uh, said, so, well, that was the ideal day. It's only urine testing. I mean, you know, oh, how sophisticated is that? How, you stick a stick in and, you know. We'd stop the test. We'd stop the test tubes by then, um, and that was it. That caused an absolute riot because I moved urine testing, and I said, "Look, I'll talk to the person who comes to teach it." We, it was a drug rep who came in to teach it. He won't mind as long as he's coming in. He doesn't mind. He'll teach it any day. This was, you know, this was there was a lot of tutting going on and upset at all this point. So anyway, we got this one day's. Uh, um, train one day input on teaching uh, communication skills. Um, but it was, a no, it was just amazing. It was an amazing exercise in this sort of inherent culture about how things can't change. They've always been this way. They're always going to be that way. So the, having the courage to challenge practice, um, I think, is incredibly important. Just because it's been that way, why? These student nurses were still able to test urine at the end of the six weeks. The outcomes were still achieved. They just did it on a different Wednesday. My card was then marked, I think, at that particular organization. And, and, and I left about a year later, actually, <laughs> to go to a slightly more interesting job. Um, the, uh, what I also did there, so I'm working full time. Uh, so I'm working full time to, uh, in, my, in my role but still wanted to learn more um, and was very interested, actually, this incident led me to really question about how organizations and, and structures work. Um, so I undertook a master's degree. I did a master's in state policy and social change. Uh, it had elements of the health, of healthcare in it. It had elements of public service in it. But it was all about, basically, the op operation of the state apparatus, a uh, bit of economics, lots of politics, lots of political theory, and this whole piece about how you get change in society. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. The thing it really did for me was to start to open up theoretical insights to how society works and how groups in society work, how power operates, how you get change. Um, and Whilst it was not necessarily healthcare, I was working in a world in which politics and the politics of change mattered. They mattered then, they matter now, probably even more so. And the lesson for me out of the master's degree was actually exposing myself to other theoretical thinking, exposing myself to you know, crowding out theory, exposing myself to social correspondence theory, starting to look at other theoretical frameworks and concepts and how that came to my practice. Um, 
there's a particular reference up there to, um, in terms of going back to this constantly challenging customer practice, there is an amazing book by a guy called Robert Lane, who's um, both a, a, an anthropologist and an economist. And I've got an incredibly dog-eared copy of this book. It was published, as you can see, back in 1991. And it's this brilliant analysis from both an anthropological, a psychological, and an economic perspective of market behaviors about these fundamentally irrational, illogical things called human beings who characterize their decisions in some ways objective and logical. Um, how we all, at the end of the day, could probably rationalize any decision if we wanted to in the context of our own logic, about ration, uh, of our own rational logic. His work was actually on um, financial markets. Well, and we know since then that they do behave in slightly odd ways in financial markets. Um, and the analysis about the, this was sort of before uh, everything became an algorithm and was sort of basically run by a set of computers and the algorithms were, were written by probably smart graduates from Imperial College, actually. Um, but it gave real meaning to looking at how you look at change both at the micro and the meso and the macro level. Now, the work that you're going to be doing, your futures, you will just encounter change all the way. You are going to be the change agents of the future. Um, you're going to encounter some brick walls, you're going to encounter some open doors. So thinking about how you do that, how you make change, how you influence people, um, there is an enormous body of theory and work to think about how you do that most effectively. And pick up a book that's something that's completely random and different from your theoretical world now and again, and expose yourself to other people's thinking. So I found that really helpful. These different, the dots are supposed to be different theoretical perspectives. Um, there's a fantastic, one of my students, one of my previous students was doing some work on um, uh, social capital, uh, the, how students from different backgrounds um, came through a widening participation program. And she, her theoretical framework was, uh, is, is a, a theory by a guy called Pierre Bourdieu. And Bourdieu talks about capital and Habermas and how people articulate and, and create sets of behaviors to ape or mirror the group they want to move into, how they acquire capital, how people lose capital, different types of capital. And it's, it's, theoretically, it's fabulous. It's, I love reading it. It's really sad, isn't it? That and government policy documents on higher education. As you can see, I'm all fun. So for me, theory is really, really important thinking about getting different people's perspectives on work. And you'll find that all the way through as you go through. Just There'll be theoretical underpinning around all of your work. Look for wider theory. Is this making any sense? The ramblings of this middle-aged woman are making any sense? Or, that's oh, good. I'll take the few nods. That'll be fine. So I'm working away, get my PhD. Oh, did my PhD, uh, sorry, did my master's uh, part-time while working full-time. So I did my master's two evenings a week from six till ten, two evenings a week for, for two years, um, and worked, and all the workload went with that. So I'm, I'm a part-time educated person. So by this time, I've been making so sufficient change in the NHS uh, in, this, in the, the next job I'd moved to. And I was, we were challenging practice and implementing changes in terms of quality, about focusing on patients. Um, but I got myself noticed by then what we had here, which were regional health authorities. And so I got tapped on the shoulder to say, hmm, would you like to come work for the regional health authority? Opportunity. I thought, you know, it would have been easy to just sit and stay in the same job. That was all safe and, and easy, you know, and it was a continuous contract. This was sort of a three, two-year contract, and I don't know what's going to happen at the end of it. I took it, did it. Fantastic. I was based in Paddington. I was spending four hours a day commuting from where I live into Paddington. Um, and we set up, we did a whole range of work around uh, changing clinical practice. This was the time when the government here in the UK was introducing the notion of evidence-based practice. 
all the research that we generate, and there was this fundamental question in, in the Department of Health around, we put all this money into universities to do all this fabulous research, and so what? How do we translate that into real impact for patients? How does Mrs. Jones get any benefit out of all of this? So that was where the whole thing around the research assessment exercise started, about impact, um, the impact of research on patient care, which is, remains, rightly so, a fixation of the NHS um, and society, I hope. So I was involved in setting up this thing called clinical audit. And uh, the government had hopefully set the money up so there was one stream of money, which was a very small um, pot for all the healthcare professionals that were not medics. And there's other rather larger pot, which is for all the medics to do audit, to engage in sort of looking at their practice against evidence. And the person, the chap who was running the medical bit, um, we met the day before we both started and we said, this is mad. Why don't we just join it all up and do it together and ignore the Department of Health? So we did. So we just joined it all up. I said, no, it's just one big pot of money. And actually, we'll look at what are the priorities for patients and for practitioners. So we questioned the rules. We changed the rules. And, you know, nobody questioned us. They just went, oh, no, that's really sensible, isn't it? So, so we set clinical audit up. So I've got a track record of sort of upsetting people or questioning. Um, set clinical audit up. We're implementing that. And... and uh, this is where my PhD came in. So at this time now, we're, we've set up a thing called the Healthcare Evaluation Unit at St. George's Hospital Medical School. Um, that then later morphed into the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, but that's a bit further down the track. So there we are doing this work around bringing evidence together to create what is a guideline for clinical practice, which is no easy job in terms of the critical appraisal of the evidence and the assembling and then building the consensus. So that's a fairly tricky bit, but my interest was in how do you actually then get people to change their practice? And back to this piece about culture and practice and these wonderfully illogical human beings who do things for the most bizarre reasons. So my work was around let's take these guidelines or various guidelines and let's look at how you implement change in practice. How do you get a group of healthcare professionals and clinicians to change their practice, to engage with the evidence and make a difference. Um, and that became the focus of my, um, my PhD. And I characterize this as the missing I in R&D. There is no I in R&D. The I being implementation. So supporting people to make change is actually just as important as sourcing the evidence in the first place about what the change might be. So hopefully did, I did a little bit towards thinking about the I in R&D. Um, Southwest Trains, so there I am working in London, living 80 miles away, four hours a day, commuting back and forth every day, uh, working full time and doing my PhD, part time. Um, and the joy of Southwest Trains, who I commuted with, and this sort of same group of people, we commuted on the same train every day, was I would sit there for hours coding my data, flicking through my questionnaires. So I used all that train time to do my, you know, the front, the break the back of my analysis. Um, and all the way through, fantastic support, brilliant supervisors, brilliant supervisors, really helped me think about how I developed independence, really encouraged me to question and challenge. And that's what your supervisors will do here. Supervisors are crucial, absolutely crucial. Um, and if that's not your experience, Jane and I would love to hear about that. Um, so all the way through uh, PhD going on, did, I finished my PhD in four years um, and uh, Fantastic. I st it's the question that still burns for me every single day, is how do you enable people to make change? You know, as I take forward the education and student strategy in the college, how do I enable people to make change? There's lots of literature about what stops people, and that's great, but actually it's more positive to think about how do you enable people to engage? How do you enable them to own it and take it and 
make it their own and make change. Um, that was um, also, there's also a question for me about um, changing the default. Uh, there was a really interesting paper. Oh, I got it up there. No. So, fantastic text that I keep going back to, which is Rogers Emmett Rogers' book on the diffusion of innovation. You know, if you look at the, the areas that you will be working in, how do you get that change into practice? How do you cascade that? Emmett talks really powerfully and interestingly, and although he did it, his work back in the 60s on agriculture and the translation, how you got farmers, how farmers in the states took forward different practices and agrarian practices, it's still that same fundamental argument about how do you get people to do things differently. And you're going to be asking people to do things differently. At some stage in your life, you will be asking people to do things differently. So Roger's Diffusion of Innovation is a fantastic read, really fantastic read. Um, it will start you thinking about, you know, do you, so if I, if I use, if I use the example, as I was developing the education of student strategy here, Rogers talks about the innovators and the early adopters, and then you get the middle who come along, and then he describes this group called the laggards. You know, they're not going to change, they don't want to change. I have a really straightforward approach to that, is I'm not going to, that's fine, that's fine. I'll work here with the innovators and the early adopters, and then as you move the curve, They'll come to you when they're ready. You don't embarrass them, and you pretend they've always been there. But a bit like uh, people who don't want to do something, I could put my entire, devote my entire attention and energy to people who don't want to do something, and they'll uh, just love it, but they still won't do it. So I might as well use the energy that I've got with the people who do want to do it, and then I now allow others to come to that place when they're ready. It doesn't seem to have done me too badly so far. So, got my PhD. Um, just, I still, I still look at the question. I still get people asking for the questionnaire. The one thing I did learn is I'm never doing another questionnaire. I'm never designing another questionnaire. Nightmare. Absolute nightmare. Validity and reliability testing endlessly. Um, so, uh, so many, there's only so many Cronbach alphas you can do before you lose the will to live, I think. So now I'm in the lucky position that I supervise people. Um, uh, I supervise amazing people and I enable them. I think the role of supervisors is absolutely crucial. It's a complete privilege to supervise research students. It's a complete privilege to supervise research um, ma uh, master students. Um, and I hope all of the people that you encounter in the Faculty of Medicine who are really committed to their students, I hope you all experience that. Um, the one thing I will say about the, my, my experience from supervising students is focus, focus, focus. The reason for the comment about another the curse of another interesting question, um, one of my recent uh, PhD students um, have a fantastic question and had a design that was this big. And we kept saying to her, that's fantastic, Gisela, but you know, it's a PhD, it's not the Nobel Prize. You know, it's a research training degree. No, I'm going to do this, this, and this, and I'm going to add another bit, right? Okay, work it through, do the logic, and you've only got X amount of time in which to do it. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll. So her thing that started this ended up there, which was absolutely fine. She kept coming up with a, that would be another really interesting question to ask. No, 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 no. Bianca, my current PhD student, was saying, oh, it's really interesting, I could do that about agency and whatever. Yeah, okay, so let's work out how you're going to do that then. Given that you've already designed the study and we've already got the ethics for it and now we want to add something else to it. So, oh, well, I could do this and that. And we sat and worked through, so uh, yeah, okay, so you're going to do that questionnaire and that's a validated questionnaire and then you're going to get it to these people. How are you going to get them? Have you got the analytic capabilities to do it? No, maybe not. Worked well. She said, I don't, it's an interesting question, but I don't think I should do that. No, I think that's really good. I think that's the right place to be. So take time. The other thing about PhDs, as far as I'm concerned, is um, time spent in preparation is never wasted. 
when the B of the bang goes for registration, then you're off and running. What I love, what we all love, is people who complete on time. That's glorious. So, you know, let's get the preparation going early. Focus, focus, focus. It's, it, there, you will find a million interesting questions that you will want to ask as well. Can I just suggest that you write them on a piece of paper and keep them? And get back to them later, maybe in the postdoc phase. But keep the study, keep, if you're doing a PhD or if you're doing a PhD, absolutely be clear about what the focus is, about your questions, about your method, about your design, about your theoretical framework. But don't lose the other interesting questions, because you may find that you'll discover them as you go, you'll answer them as you go along. Um, but once you've decided on your design, uh, it, it becomes quite challenging to change it. So it would be really interesting, as I said to be it would be really interesting, it would be lovely to know that, but we just don't have, you're just not going to be able to do it. You're still going to do a fantastically interesting PhD anyway. Anybody tempted by another interesting question or something they're already doing? Anybody just sitting there going, oh, I'll just, I'll just it'd be nice if I knew what that happened when that was green, or, you know, let's not just do bacteria, let's do viruses. It's like, no. <laughs> it's a PhD, it's a research training degree. You do all of that as you're preparing for your Nobel Prize. So I hope that the supervisors that you get are as, uh, I know the supervisors you get will be fantastic quality. Um, but this is also about your transition to independence in terms of research. And that's really important. It's about making, it's thinking about the challenging questions that you want to ask as well. Taking the field beyond. It's absolutely fine to question and take things beyond your supervisor. You may well be the one person who comes up with a really innovative way of thinking about a particular problem. It may well be you who changes the default on the particular assumptions that you've been working with in an area. And don't be afraid to think outside of the box, beyond the box, and whatever you do, question the concept of box. Because this has to be about rigorous, this has to be theoretically rigorous. So um, it's an absolute joy to supervise. Uh, it's a fantastic, doing a PhD is a fantastic thing to do. Doing a master's, a really challenging master's here is a fantastic thing to do. And I, I'm back to this thing about, there's a, a, an expression which is nothing, there is nothing as good, there is nothing as, there's nothing as useful as good theory. Um, theory helps you think. Theory gives you frameworks. It gives you perspectives to think about things. So I'm a bit of a fan of theory. I don't know whether you've noticed that. I tend to go on about it a bit. So please make use of it. Please challenge your assumptions. Look at other worlds. There'll be things that you can learn from other disciplines. It's really easy to get sort of sometimes trapped in a disciplinary silo when you're thinking about particularly challenge, particular challenges. And there are other worlds in which there is literature and theory that might just say, actually, that's the thing that just made me think, you know, green is black or something. Is this making any sense? Hmm. So after, after getting the PhD and, and uh, being at George's, the next thing I know is I'm uh, recruited to go and run a big education project at the University of Southampton. Uh, had a great time doing that, doing major curriculum change, getting people from different disciplines to learn together getting medical students to learn with other students of health professionals because actually, do you know, in practice, they all have to work together, strangely. Um, and, and me as the receiver of the service, I don't really want you lot rehearsing your difficulties with me. I just want you to focus on me. So went to the University of Southampton, did lots of educational change there, um, got major government funding for all of that then set up a healthcare evaluation, uh, innovation unit. So we were looking at different types of workforce. Again, constantly challenging assumptions, looking at how we deliver healthcare. And then the next thing, I know the vice chancellor has, um, tells me he's got a plan. And uh, there was a vacancy for the vice provost education, uh, the pro-vice chancellor education. And uh, obviously all of these posts have been interviewed for. Um, I find myself as the Pro-Vice Chancellor Education, that's not something I ever thought would happen. Um, and again, we did change. We opened up opportunities in the curriculum for students. We got students from different disciplines 
following their interests. You may well be passionate about the discipline that you've come to study, but I don't know that you're also not fantastically passionate about ethics or the law or the environment. And I hope here you'll find there's lots of opportunities to attend lectures, maybe even other sessions in other programs to hear about the amazing research that goes on in this place. I get the, the news feed every day, so the communications department produces an email about the news feed of what Imperial being quoted to doing today. And it's just a constant stream of extraordinary things that people are discovering and doing. So take the opportunity to look around the university. Go and listen to some of the public lectures on, on other things. There's a woman coming from EDF Energy on Tuesday night to do a whole lecture about um, her. She's the head of basically HR at EDF. Massive company really concerned about its future talent. Not quite sure where it's going to get its future talent. Really focusing on trying to find the workforce of the future as they change their business, as they think about energy in different ways. And they are looking for their talent now. Um, so there's lots of those sorts of opportunities in the university. Please take, take a chance on those. And then I started here about uh, two years ago. I'm just, I'm just shy, a week shy of having started here two years ago. And it's been the most amazing place. It is extraordinary. It's full of amazing people, fantastic students. Um, but it's only as good as it is because we all contribute to it. So I hope you enjoy your time at Imperial. Um, play your part. Get involved. Fantastic students' union. Great support for you. Um, and just remember... There is more to life than work, no matter what Jane tells you. There's quite a lot of social things that happen here. We've got five orchestras. We've got 300 clubs and societies in the Students' Union. We've got a brilliant Students' Union. Uh, cinema, oh, a whole load of things. So enjoy your time here. Don't just work hard. Have a life as well. It's been great to meet you. I don't know how the ramblings of a middle-aged woman are going to help you, but... Um, it's been fantastic to meet you, and I wish you every, every success. Thank you.